Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Courtney Goodwin. I am the social media manager here at Prisma Health. On behalf of Prisma Health, we would like to thank you for joining us for a Facebook Live Town Hall. February is American Heart Month, an important time to spotlight and discuss heart disease. So this month, Prisma Health has joined others in bringing awareness and providing educational information on how to prevent heart disease, how to recognize the signs of heart failure, and ways to take care of your heart. So today, as we close out American Heart Month, we have a panel of Prisma Health experts that will answer questions and provide information on how to be heart healthy. So today on our panel, we have Dr. James Apadu. He is a heart failure cardiologist in the Midlands. We have Dr. Marcelo Fernandez. He's a cardiologist in the upstate. We have Dr. Michael Cryer. He is a cardiologist in the Midlands. And Dr. Brad Stevens cardiologist in the upstate. So thank you all for joining us today. So let's get started with our first question. And this question will go to Dr. Apadu. All right, so is there a test or screening to learn more about heart health? Yes, uh, you know, I would say first, it starts with uh, seeing your primary care provider. And uh, at that visit, they should be able to uh, assess your individual risk for cardiovascular disease, uh, as such being high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, obesity. And after that, uh, potentially some patients may need uh, further specialists like a cardiologist uh, to then uh, screen you specifically. Thank you. All right, so our next question will go to Dr. Cryer. I'm going to pin you up here. Are there any specific popular diets like vegan or Atkins diet that are awful for cardiovascular health? Yeah, uh, so to understand the question, did you say that are awful that are not good for cardiac health? Yes, I'm asking, yes. Okay. Yeah. Any diets? Yeah, so it's a good question. Diets, you know, this is a very popular uh, thing, especially in, in pop science and, and stuff like that. We, I think we often see these things come up on social media. The new trial shows caffeine is good for you. The next week, lay, you know, the caffeine's bad for you, or you know, carbs are good for you, then they're bad for you, or fats are good for you, and they're bad for you. So, you know, it's really difficult to ascertain or, or figure out from these studies what a good diet is because it is extremely difficult to run a study where we can fully randomize someone to a diet and study outcomes. So a lot of this stuff is just studied retrospectively. As we look back and try to figure out people who reported a certain diet had these sort of symptoms and did this well. And, and that sort of science just leads to often more questions than it does answers. Um, you know, my practice and what I've seen, things that tend to lead to better heart health are things like lower carb diets. I do think that's something uh, that's beneficial um, that sort of falls in the realms uh, realm of the Atkins diet. I don't know if going full bore with, with no carbs is the way to go, but certainly a low carb or carb conscious diet um, would lead to a better lipid profile and, and would, um, would, we would think lead to better heart health. Um, uh, another popular diet that's been around, uh, recently has been intermittent fasting. I'm sure a lot of folks have heard about that. Uh, that's a diet where, um, folks will eat, uh, essentially once per day. Um, they'll take a good 18 hours off from food, whereas a fasting period, uh, that's thought to stimulate the metabolism. There's really no good evidence for it. Um, I generally don't recommend it. Um, you know, some people, um, I know will kind of do a version of this where they have small snacks in between just one big meal, uh, for part of the day, I would say in terms of, um, you know, sort of answering the opposite of the question, what's a good diet rather than what's a bad diet. But, uh, I would recommend whatever leads to a carb conscious diet with a healthy weight and exercise is the best way to go. And, Avoiding, um, you know, sugary drinks and focusing mostly on hydrating with water is also very component, very important component to the diet. Thank you. All right, so next we will go to Dr. Fernandez. So this question is from a patient. So they stated, I have on occasions a pulsing in my arm, which I can see movement. Can that be a muscle spasm or something serious? Yeah, I mean, you know, muscle spasms can, can cause pulsating sort of sensation or appearance on um, whichever part of the body is impacted, but it usually is not related to the heart. Um, I would just recommend following up with a primary care provider um, 
because that's not, you know, something that we would think of that would be a, a cause of heart disease or related to heart disease. Okay, thank you. All right, so Dr. Stevens, we have a question for you. With aortic insufficiency, is a person at risk for an aneurysm? Um, so it's kind of the opposite, actually. So aortic insufficiency is you know, leakiness of your aortic valve. And you're actually at risk for that if you have an aortic aneurysm. So it's the other way around. So as your aorta enlarges, you know, sometimes that can lead to leakiness, both, both findings of which we monitor over time with different studies, ultrasounds of the heart. Um, for both the aorta enlargement as well as the aortic insufficiency. And then, and then some people need CT or MRI for further monitoring of their um, aortic aneurysms. Thank you. So we're going to move doc back to Dr. Abdul. We'll put you up back here. So the question is, who should take an aspirin a day and how does aspirin help your heart? Okay. Uh, first, I kind of want to explain how aspirin works. Uh, and then we can kind of uh, dive into the guidelines. So aspirin works by inhibiting platelet, platelet function and uh, platelets are involved in uh, the body's uh, mechanism of forming a blood clot. So you can imagine in a heart attack or stroke, uh, you want to reduce the amount of blood clot, clot, clot to uh, uh, improve blood flow. Um, but also because you're thinning the blood, that puts you at risk for bleeding. So the current guidelines have changed. So if you're uh, greater than the age of 60, uh, it's not recommended to take an aspirin every day because of the increased risk of bleeding. Also, if uh, you're age 40 to 59 without significant cardiac risk, it's also not recommended to take an aspirin every day. If you're between the ages of 40 to 59 with uh, increased cardiovascular risk, that's a decision that's made on an individual basis between the patient and the physician, whether you should take aspirin. Thank you. Hey, Dr. Cryer. So your question from a patient is, smart watches tell you what your heart resting rate is, but why is that important to know? And what is an abnormal rate and what can people do about it? Yeah, great question. Uh, this is becoming uh, common in our clinics. We see a lot of uh, people coming in with smart watches um, you know, and it seems like every couple months, the uh, smartwatches are more capable and what they can do with health uh, related uh, smart apps and, and, and monitoring. Uh, one thing we've had for a while now is the monitoring of heart rate. So resting heart rate, overnight heart rates. Uh, some of the smartwatches have apps that can uh, trigger or sense abnormal um, or changes in the heart rate. Um, there's one entity called atrial fibrillation that has been pretty popular and the AI algorithms have gotten pretty good at figuring out when somebody's in this rhythm. Uh, you know, a, a normal resting heart rate is somewhere between 60 and 100 uh, beats per minute. Um, it's okay to be in that range. And, you know, some people are a little bit lower, some people are a little bit higher. It, it all is relative to what other medical uh, problems that person may have or symptoms they may be having. Um, I wouldn't say there's one specific uh, number that exactly you know, crosses a threshold, but certainly, uh, you know, heart rhythms that are going too fast at rest over 120 beats per minute would be uh, worthwhile of a, um, you know, a visit to a cardiologist and then maybe some additional testing. Um, what's interesting about all this information with these watches is we don't quite have enough information about what to do with them. You know, is it good to be um, constantly monitoring all these heart rates? Are we picking up more disease and identifying patients uh, with an illness that are otherwise healthy? Like, you know, in other words, is the illness real? Are we just identifying something that's normal, but we're just measuring it now. Um, so over the next five years or so, I think we'll be uh, getting a lot more information on some trials and things that we're doing to figure out, um, you know, with these AI, AI algorithms and these smartwatches, what's abnormal and what should we act on and what can we ignore? And that's kind of where we are right now. Thank you. That was great information. I know a lot of people rely on their watches. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, of course. All right, Dr. Fernandez. So the question for you is, if you have a job that requires you to sit most of the day, what can you do to keep your heart healthy? Is it enough to just focus on your diet? Yeah, it's a good question. So um, diet is important as we all know, but exercise is um, equally if not even more important. Um, exercise lowers the risk of heart disease, stroke, even dementia. So um, 
you know, what we recommend or American Heart Association recommends is 150 minutes of exercise per week or 75 minutes of vigorous exercise per week. If you have a very busy job um, where your time is limited, I would recommend just doing more vigorous exercise for a shorter period of time, as opposed to sort of uh, the long walks, but at a lower pace. So things like, you know, vigorous exercise includes running, um, swimming, um, tennis, um, whereas the lower intensity exercise include for activities, include gardening um, or doubles tennis. Um, so overall, my recommendation would be, you know, really maximize your time and engage in vigorous exercise, um, which less requires less time, but it's very effective. Thank you. I know the people who work from home, they'll appreciate that advice. All right, so next let's go to Dr. Stevens. So what does it mean to have shortness of breath and how do you know if it's being caused by a heart issue? Um, good question. So you know, shortness of breath is just a sensation of having a difficult time breathing. Um, it can be due to lots of things. You know, some of them are heart related, but you know, um, many other possible causes of shortness of breath are, are not related to the heart, um, including you know, multiple lung issues, pneumonia, COPD, um, as well as things like anemia. Um, I think a, a lot of trying to figure out, you know, why you're short of breath is also important to figure out if you have any other associated symptoms like swelling of the legs or if your shortness of breath is mostly at rest or when you're moving around. So if you're having any of those symptoms, I would recommend going to see your primary care provider so they can fully, um, you know, evaluate your symptoms as well as maybe any other symptoms you might be having to help determine the best way to uh, test you and figure out what's causing the symptoms. Thank you for sharing that. Dr. Aperdu, your question is, is warm weather climate better for someone with heart disease? And what about severe hot weather? That's a good question as we live in South Carolina. Um, you know, there is some data that uh, has shown uh, an association with, you know, higher temperatures, like uh, temperatures greater than 95 degrees Fahrenheit and more humid environments where you see an, an increase in heart attacks and irregular heart rhythms. But again, it's an association, not a causation. So, you know, we do want to take the necessary precautions, always checking the weather, making sure you stay hydrated. Uh, if you're going to be uh, outside, try to, you know, uh, use uh, sunscreen, sunblock, and stay in shady areas if possible. Thank you. All right, Dr. Cryer. The next question is for you. So what is a heart murmur and how is it treated? Yeah, so a heart murmur um, is something that's described on the physical exam. Um, this is often picked up with a um, primary care appointment. Sometimes uh, other providers will uh, refer patients they've heard murmurs on and send them to us as cardiologists to, to further work up. And you know, what these are, what this murmur is, is the sound of blood um, essentially moving across the heart in a certain way. Um, there are a lot of murmurs that are benign or, or not really of, uh, you know, concern, uh, especially in thin, younger, healthier folks. They can have something called a flow murmur, where just the high flow across um, the aortic valve just creates a little bit of a hum, and we hear that on our stethoscope. But there are other murmurs that can be, um, you know, that can be associated with things like heart failure and, and cause problems if they're severe enough. Um, so we have four large valves uh, in our heart, and uh, some of them can become tight over time, and some of them can become leaky. Lucky these are not very common entities, but we certainly in our cardiology clinic see them. Um, if they become severely, you know, tight or leaky, they may require intervention or a fix of that valve. Uh, there can sometimes be um, holes in the heart, congenital holes in the heart, so things that uh, individuals may be born with, and those uh, small holes, if they're small enough, may not be of much consequence, but if they're larger, they can, may need um, intervention or, or correction in surgery, sometimes as even an infant. Uh, but if those holes persist throughout um, a patient's um, life into their adulthood, and small enough, they can sometimes cause a, a murmur. Um, and those um, tend to be picked up, um, you know, by, by physical exam, by putting the stethoscope on the chest and listening uh, in the right areas. Thank you. Okay. So we have a question that came in. If your family has a history of heart disease, should you be screened differently from others? 
Dr. Cryer. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so if your family has a history of heart disease, should you be screened? I guess it depends on what the heart disease is. Um, you know, the, the layman's term for heart disease probably means anything wrong with the heart. Um, we sort of identify heart disease more to do with coronary heart disease, um, if we use that term. Uh, so if somebody has coronary heart disease, that would be the formation of atherosclerosis or plaque in the heart arteries. Um, you know, having a family history of that to me is one of the most, uh, certainly a, an important risk factor for an, an individual having, um, you know, plaque in their heart as well. Unfortunately, genetics um, is not something we can, we can't control that. It is what it is. And having a certain predisposition or genetics to make um, plaque compared to somebody else whose genetics don't necessarily make plaque is, is something that we have to battle and um, identifying that at a younger age. So if there is a strong family history of uh, coronary plaque, uh, being evaluated younger in life or as with a lipid profile to see how much bad cholesterol versus good cholesterol you'll have certainly um, would make sense. I don't know if I'd go beyond that. I think starting with a, a lipid profile, a history and a physical um, would be something that would be important to do certainly in early adulthood. Um, there's a ton of other genetic abnormalities. You know, Dr. Ampadu sees this a lot with uh, genetic things that can cause heart failure. There are a lot of guidelines that recommend genetic screening with um, some of those conditions. I think getting into the details of all that, um, you know, with this uh, venue would be probably a bit much. So I'd kind of just leave it with the kind of broad statement uh, that I mentioned before. Okay. Thank you for sharing that and for answering that question that came in. All right. Dr. Fernandez, so your question is, what is the difference between heart disease and heart failure? Yeah, so um, heart disease relates to uh, narrowing of the coronary arteries. The coronary arteries are the arteries that supply oxygenated blood to the heart muscle. And so if there is narrowing of the coronaries, then that, that could be, that is heart disease. So uh, there's mild narrowing, there's more severe narrowing. And in the appropriate clinical context, if there's more severe narrowing, then we would either have to open that up with a stent or even in more extreme cases, refer a patient for bypass surgery. Um, uh, heart failure is a clinical diagnosis, but um, to keep it simple, it relates to the weakening of the heart muscle um, in a way where either the, the heart muscle is such that it can't generate enough contractility to get blood out of the heart, so it's a little bit weak. There's also a different kind of heart failure when the heart is, um, uh, is too stiff and it can't relax well enough to accommodate more blood into the heart. Um, so those are the, the, the two broad kinds of heart failure, um, which is different in heart disease because heart disease, as I mentioned, uh, relates to blockage of the coronary arteries. Thank you for answering that question. All right, Dr. Stevens. So how high is your cholesterol when you have a heart attack and what are the signs? The, si the signs of, of what? I'm not sure if I quite follow that. So the question is how high is your cholesterol when you have a heart attack and what are the signs of a heart attack? Oh, the signs of a heart attack. All right, well, let's start. The cholesterol levels um, vary, you know, with the time of a heart attack. Um, you know, we certainly see different levels. I would say in general, high, you know, higher cholesterol is certainly a, a risk factor for developing um, heart disease, plaque buildup in, in the arteries. And once you've had a heart attack or have heart disease, whether it be obstructive or even just, you know, moderate plaque or sometimes even mild plaque, we will likely put you on some sort of cholesterol lowering therapy. And we have certain targets of, of bad cholesterol levels that we'd like to get you under, um, depending on your medical history. As far as signs of a heart attack, I mean, I think the most common would be um, you know, chest tightness at the sort of the bottom of your sternum. Um, sometimes it can radiate to your jaw, down your arm, to your back. Um, you know, I think that'll be the most classic description, but certainly uh, other people can experience, you know, cardiac related discomfort in, in other ways. Um, so I think if you're concerned, certainly, you know, getting checked out uh, is the right thing to do. Thank you. Dr. Apadul, your question is, can heart disease be reversed? Okay. Uh, you know, I think we already kind of talked about what heart disease is, but you know, I'll say heart disease is kind of an umbrella term encompassing, as we already mentioned, coronary artery disease, the narrowing of the arteries, and also encompassing heart failure uh, as well. And I would say, uh, first and foremost, it can be prevented. It's all about early prevention. We talked about 
following with your primary care and potentially specialist, uh, then once it's established, it can be stabilized. And that's kind of some of the things that uh, the doctors on this panel uh, focus on. And then uh, once it's stabilized, it can be improved. And again, we focus on the things that contribute to heart disease, which are diabetes, high blood pressure, cholesterol, obesity, obstructive sleep apnea, these kind of things. Thank you. All right, Dr. Cryer. So your question is, can a blood clot cause a heart attack? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, in, in two ways, really, it can. So, um, you know, a heart attack um, in its classic form is, you know, sort of the uh, sudden onset of heart symptoms. Usually it's chest pain. And the classic is sort of feeling the tightness in your chest and, and that squeezing. Um, sometimes it's not as classic. Sometimes it's more nausea and shortness of breath. Um, but when this happens fast, um, it's usually from a complete, you know, occlusion in the uh, one of the heart arteries. Now, most of the time that um, occlusion in the heart artery has uh, occurred because some area of plaque that was there uh, has either ruptured, kind of popped like a pimple in some way, and uh, that rupturing uh, aggravates and, and turns on a lot of the things in our body that like to form clots. So the, that rupture in that area of the heart artery will allow clot to start forming, and that will lead to the blockage in the artery. Sometimes um, the plaque itself erodes a little bit and, and that can cause uh, the, the clot to form as well, uh, which is a small nuance. But so that's one way a blood clot would cause a heart attack. In its most classic sense, the heart attacks that we see, the ones portrayed in movies and stuff like that are most of the time that sort of situation. Uh, there's another way a heart uh, or a clot can cause a heart attack and we call that embolization. So that would be uh, somebody who has a predisposition or a setup for clot to form in a chamber in the heart, say, uh, you know, in the uh, a little appendage on the side of the heart that is at risk if you have atrial fibrillation for developing clot, that can break free and sometimes it finds itself in a heart artery. Um, it can go anywhere in the body. Um, and one of those arteries it can go to is a heart artery itself. So that is sometimes a reason that we see um, a heart attack uh, occur. There's no plaque in the heart, but there was a clot that formed somewhere in one of the chambers of the heart that broke free and went to that artery and caused the, um, caused the issue. Now, luckily, um, you know, we have a lot of stuff set in place for patients to be recognized early and brought to our cath labs emergently and, and, and have their heart uh, artery fixed, usually with a balloon and stent uh, procedure that can get rid of that blockage and take that from 100% to 0%. Uh, so it's just very important to people are having these symptoms that they not ignore them and they come in and get evaluated to make sure this isn't happening. Uh, an EKG, a simple 12 lead EKG can be 12, done in five minutes and most of the time gives us, a, gives us the answer we need. Thank you, that was very helpful. So Dr. Fernandez, I know Dr. Cryer and Dr. Stevens mentioned uh, plaque buildup, but your question is what foods can cause plaque buildup in your heart? Yeah, well, um, so, you know, the, the one that we know most about are, are foods that are high in trans-saturated fats. So these include red meat. Uh, those, I mean, red meat um, is, is well recognized as a uh, type of food that can raise your LDL, which is a bad cholesterol, and lead to deposition of atherosclerotic plaque in the coronary arteries. Um, but just, you know, excessive food intake as well can do it. Um, foods that are, that are high in sugar, um, so all of that can contribute to atherosclerotic plaque buildup in, uh, in the coronary arteries. Thank you. Right, Dr. Stevens? Your question from a patient is, does low blood pressure cause heart attacks? Um, well, yeah, low blood pressure is, is not associated you know, with the increased risk of heart attacks. Certainly we get more concerned about high blood pressure, hypertension, um, and your goal of blood pressure is, you know, kind of in general is under 140 over 90 and can even be lower than that, depending on your underlying medical conditions. Um, certainly important to, uh, you know, monitor your blood pressure occasionally at home if you can, um, you know, even once every week or two would be great. Um, we always like to have more information when we see in the office instead of just one, one random blood pressure at the office visit. So having more readings from home can certainly help us make sure that your blood pressure is, is at goal. Thank you. All right. The next question is for Dr. Epidule. Why are younger people dying from heart attacks? 
This is a great question. Uh, you know, I would say we're seeing our younger patients suffer from heart attacks as well as heart failure because we're seeing um, early onset and advancement in these risk factors for uh, cardiovascular disease, which we talked about. So our younger patients uh, may be obese, they may have high blood pressure, may have diabetes, sleep apnea, some of them smoke cigarettes. And as we already mentioned, it's very important to know your family history because you may be taking on risks uh, even without those comorbidities. So it's, it's good to follow up with your pediatrician, with your uh, primary care, and then with your cardiologist for these diseases. Thank you. Well, thank you all for joining us today. That's all the questions that we have. So what I would like to do now is just go around and get any final thoughts from our panelists. So Dr. Cryer, I'll start with you. Any final thoughts for our audience today? I just wanna thank you for having me on. It's, um, you know, with it being Heart Month and we're wrapping up here with the last day of February. Um, I just think this is an important event to um, discuss questions that the community has. I think we talk a lot amongst ourselves about, you know, things we, uh, as cardiologists, you know, treat and want to work on. But, you know, I think we don't often enough take the time to um, discuss uh, openly with, with the public, you know, their concerns and their questions and get uh, and, and discuss in an open forum things that they're thinking about. And, um, and, and answering these questions that they have, I think, you know, in, in a manner like this provides a forum to, to, you know, get the information out there and, and to, you know, see, see where they're coming from with the concerns that they have rather than the concerns that we have, because it's at the end of the day that their concerns are more important. Uh, they're the patients, they're the ones that need to be seen. Absolutely. All right, Dr. Fernandez, any final thoughts? Yeah, just uh, want to thank uh, Prisma Health for putting this together. I think it's, you know, the more information that patients have, the better uh, they're equipped to ask questions and, and be mindful about uh, their own health. Um, and if there is any further questions uh, that a patient may have, may have certainly uh, follow up with your cardiologist. If you don't have a cardiologist, uh, you know, uh, ask your primary care for a referral. And we'll be happy to see you. Thank you. Dr. Stevens. Uh, yeah, I would agree with Dr. Fernandez. You know, thank you for having me on today. Um, I'm sure there are probably a lot of questions that people have that, that we didn't discuss today. And um, if you have any questions specific to your own cardiovascular health, um, you know, please see your primary care doctor or feel free to call us and make an appointment. We'd be happy to discuss any specific questions or concerns you have or just evaluate your general cardiac health um, going forward. Thank you. All right. Dr. Appadou, any final uh, thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think I'm just going to second what everybody else uh, said. But first, you know, I want to thank Prisma for, bringing, for putting this together. You know, I think it's all about awareness and education in order to empower your community. And so uh, I think this is a, a great movement towards that. Um, thank you for having me on. And if you guys do have further questions, cardiology related, heart failure related, uh, then we'll welcome you with open arms in our advanced heart, heart clinic uh, here at uh, Prisma Richmond. Well, thank you all for being here. Thank you for everyone online for tuning in. If you have any additional questions after our live, please leave them in the comments and we'll be sure to respond to them. Like they stated, if you have any additional questions or information about Heart Month, please visit our website. Thank you all for tuning in. We'll see you at our next Facebook Live Town Hall. Have a good day.